Welcome to Allie's Awareness Avenue. This is a show where we talk about life issues, all kinds of life issues, abuse, disability, mental health, addictions, you name it, we're going to talk about it. Um, t today we're going to talk about mental health. And I just want to, before I introduce my guest, who I'm so happy that I have on, I just want to say that one in four people in the world are affected by mental or neurological disorders at some point in their lives. Around 450 million people currently suffer from conditions placing mental disorders among the leading cause of ill health and disability worldwide. That's a staggering, staggering stuff. My guest today knows all about this and I, I'm also his friend and I absolutely adore him. Please welcome Roland Vandell. Hi Roland. Hi. How's it going? Good, how are you? Eh, I'm tired. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a busy man. Um, so, yeah. Roland, I, I mean, I've had you on my show before um, regarding your book, which we're also going to talk about. But um, just tell everybody a bit about yourself. Well, I, uh, I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and uh, I'm 46 years old, and uh, and one of uh, Actually, May 15th, I just turned 16 years sober. So, yes, uh, I've been free from drugs and alcohol for 16 years now. Mm -hmm. That is such, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm part of, uh, I'm on the board of directors of, uh, 47 Bed Homeless Mission, uh, the Red Road Lodge, and, uh, I have, uh, uh, specialized youth home, and, uh, I just opened up another youth home, and I'm a third level national boxing coach. Uh, and I have a, I have a, I own a boxing gym with my son Kent Brown, and uh, he used to be on the Canadian Olympic team. And and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a busy guy. I, I speak all over Canada and the states, well over 700 times now. Wow. And um, yeah, so life is good. Now you also have three documentaries out. Yeah, one is uh, the, the National Film Board of Canada did one, and that that one was called uh, Fight. I think that's I think that's on Netflix. I think something like that. Okay. Uh, and then and then uh, the other one is Showing the Void by Just TV, and uh, the big one is uh, done by CBC. That's uh, the Wounded Hero, the Roland Blackwell story. Okay. And uh, yeah, and I just actually just signed uh, a lot. Last year, it's probably going to take a while to put together, but um, I just signed uh, um, I just signed a contract for my life rights for uh, a feature movie deal by Julie Jet Productions is going to do it. Awesome! Now yeah. you've, you've also won numerous awards for what you do. Yeah, which is awesome. How many awards now is it? <laughs> I don't even. Do you have count? Do you have you kept count? <laughs> yeah, well. Um, I got the Manitoba Heroes Award, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, then I got the uh, uh, what's it called uh, one of Manitoba's finest by the Kid Kidney Foundation of Manitoba. Okay. And uh, and I got the John C. Maxwell Leadership Award, and uh, that was uh, from Orlando, Florida. Nice. And uh, and yeah, I've gotten a I've gotten a bigger, bigger commitment award of Manitoba by the uh, Manitoba Human Rights Commission and uh, and I got the TJ's Gift Champion Award um, and uh, yeah I'm, I'm missing a couple but I can't remember <laughs> that's okay that's okay I'm just I'm so I'm so glad that you're being recognized for being so open and sharing about your life so let's talk about mental health Roland because I know you you know way more about it than I do well, you know what? Like I would just talk with a few people. This is my life every day. I deal with all this stuff, and now, um, and um, like I also help out in corrections, uh, in, in uh, provincial and federal corrections, and and uh, and anyways, like um, the mental health piece. Like uh, I've been, I've been seeing a doctor for fifteen years now, and. Uh, and it helps me. I don't go as much as I used to, but it, you know, I, I've also been through the DPT, dialectical behavior therapy, mm -hmm. um, 
dealing with abuse. I've been sexually and physically abused by six different people, and and um, and getting to that, like, anyways, I, I ended up being homeless at uh, at in my late twenties, and and uh, I got sober on May fifteenth, two thousand and two, um, and. I always mix it up between 2002 and 2001. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. But I'm 16 years sober. And I, if I do the math, it's, I, it's one of those. I'm 16 years sober. So, <laughs> um, I spent all of my 30s repairing my 20s. And uh, and it's only been in my 40s that I've been, you know, I've been doing really well for myself. And, and um, but, you know, like, the, the thoughts of, the, the, the thoughts, they're always there, right? Like, uh, you know, I carry it over me. Like, I was just telling my friend of mine, you know, I feel like I've got a black cloud over me. Like, I feel like, you know, um, that's PTSD, right? Like, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. reality is that I have a good life, and reality is that I have a good, good handful of people around me, and reality is that usually the thoughts in my head are, I'm no good at I'm, I can't do anything right. What's the point anyhow? They don't mean like, uh, those thoughts wash over me and I have to, I have to do what I gotta do. I get up and I help other people and I need to, like, I'm sharp as a marble, so it's very easy for me to, like, like I can be teachable and coachable and those are the keys to change for anybody, right? Like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I don't need to correct people. I don't need to be right all the time. You know, like, I've gone through lots of battles with that because you know, sometimes feeling worthless, you try to compensate with that by maybe arguing or or correcting people or trying to feel like, you know, trying to feel like you're right all the time or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's all ego, right? Yeah. And it's about control a bit, too, I think, too, because you feel so out of control, you have to control something. Yeah, exactly. That's perfect way to say it. Everything I just said? Yes. Yeah, you just said it. <laughs> In one <laughs> <laughs> wow, in one sentence. Um, yeah. As you know, my family, um, Roland went to brother, school with my brother, and we don't need to mention names. Um, my family suffers from a lot of mental health disorders, um, bipolar 2, anxiety disorder, you name it, it's there, alcoholism, um, drug addiction. So um, I know a lot about it, and I've dealt with a lot of it. Um, you, though... <laughs> To me, Roland, you're my, you're my, when I start feeling like that, when the cloud starts getting over me, because I, it took me till my late forties to actually straighten my life out. And I'm now 50 and now I feel like I'm actually in a good place, but I feel the same way as you. I have down days where I have days where I don't think I do anything good. And why am I doing this? And I'm just going to give up. And I know people in my family feel the same way and I've never really been suicidal, but people in my family have, um, my great grandfather yeah. actually committed suicide Christmas Eve. Um, so that's very prevalent in my family. Um, you just always seem to keep going and you do so much for other people. And you're just like, when I, when I start feeling bad, I just start thinking about people like you that, you know, just keep going and write books and talk to people and go all across the world talking to people. And it just, you're inspiring. And I know that's a heavy title to hold. Um, but because you are so open and talking and you talk about it, you're not, you're not afraid to hide it where a lot of people do. I think that's why I just, like you are, you're inspiring, Rowan. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know, though. it's like a, it's like a catch 22, like, uh, um, I don't know. Cause like, uh, I'm so open and honest. I think it's, in, I think it's uh, intimidating to a lot of people. Like I, I don't have, I don't have a lot of friends, you know, I've got a, again, a good handful of people, but like, uh, you know, I think that's sometimes a blessing in disguise, right? Like, uh, like I'm very honest and I'm open and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, you know, there's no gray area. I, I mean what I say and say what I mean. And, and sometimes you don't make a lot of friends that way, right? So. Well, um, not everybody's comfortable with being open and honest. I think so. Like I, I'm in recovery and and uh, and uh, the recovery community uh, or the work that you do in the recovery community has completely transformed my life and and you know like what the one thing you recover in recovery is 
your sense of self, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel like I'm 46 years old and I'm okay with people in my life and I'm okay with all people in my life. And, and I'm like an introvert, extrovert. I, I can pull it off when I need to be in public, but I'd rather not. I, I kind of like being alone, right? So, yeah. Whereas before, I hated being uh, alone. I, I, was, I was crawling in my in my own skin, and and uh, but we're we're today it's not like that anymore, right? So mm-hmm. I just want to encourage young people, like you know, our twenties. No matter who you are, no matter what ails you, no matter what you think you're suffering from, or what you actually are suffering from, you know. Um, it is, it's very common, like mental health issues is very common and, and whereas maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whatever, it was kind of like looked at as a form of weakness to, to, to be so vulnerable that you're exposing your, how you're really thinking. You know, in today's world, it's changed, right? And it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to be not doing well and it's okay not to be okay and, you know, all those things are, are a start to being okay. You know, is getting help and it's all it's all right, man. You know, like yeah. I don't judge anybody for for uh, for struggling. Struggling is a part of succeeding, right? So exactly. Well, and I'm glad you reached out to young people because I mean, they are our future, and they need. We were talking about bullying yesterday and how it always, you know, comes from stems from the home and home life yeah. and what's happening in their life and that leads to you know how they act and i think unfortunately still in today's society there are a lot of parents that would rather brush it under the rug and pretend it's not happening than to deal with it or to admit to it and admit that there is something and it's not that there's something wrong with their child it's that it's a mental health disorder or it, it could be a number of things but you have to talk about it and you have to deal with it um Oprah Winfrey said one of the best lines I have ever heard, and this is this is towards men, but it's women too, the way our world's getting. Men don't cry tears, they cry bullets. And yeah. I think with women, we're we're taught that it's okay to talk. We have girlfriends to talk to, we have our mothers, sisters, whatever the case may be. Men, on the other hand, are taught that you have to be strong, you can't show, you know, emotion, you can't cry, you can't do anything. And well, I'll tell you what, if you ask any one of my friends, mm-hmm. I, spent, I literally spent 14 years like uh, in sharing circles and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I, was, I was in chairs every day. It took a long time for me to heal. And I, I, I was judged for that, eh? But mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a fighter. I don't give, I don't care who talks about me or anything. And you, you know, you find out your true friends that way, right? So. Exactly. And I, that's what I found out in the last few years because I had to get rid of the drama because there was just too much drama in my life and I had to get rid of it in order for me to heal. <laughs> and it's amazing yeah. who you who you want around you after you've kind of going, and I'm still going through it. I mean, I'm never going to be okay for I don't know how long. Um, but I have a, a fantastic doctor. Now, in, in talking about mental health too, Roland, I want to ask you, do you believe in medicating? Um. I'm not a doctor, so like I know I know for me there was a few times that I was that uh that I was kind of um encouraged to go on, on meds and uh-huh. I don't really know a whole lot about meds, but yeah. I know that the kids are using them as currency on the street. Yes. So in the, in that in that aspect I don't believe in prescription drugs, but I'm sure a lot of people need them. Like uh, in our homeless mission, we have a lot of really suffering people with really deep diagnoses, and and uh, and so as a you know, um, I, I I don't know. I know the pain meds, you know, like so that you know if they need them, they need them. But I don't know. I think the personality of somebody tells the tale if they're going to be become dependent on those things, right? So. Yeah. Well, and I find you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not against it, but I you know when I when I, like again I have a level five uh, youth home and and I hear what happens on the street and and uh, prescription drugs are used as currency. Yeah, you don't even need money anymore if you have if you have pain meds or any kind of prescription yeah. drugs that get you high or bring you down or bring you up. You know they they use those uh, as money. I know. 
And I think too, and I'm going to talk about my situation. Um, I was diagnosed with a disability as well as mental health. And I was in a small town um, where I, I went back to my hometown. And the, I think the small town doctor didn't really know what to do. And she prescribed everything she could possibly think of. And it was depressing taking pills. I mean, it was just crazy. And I think that, like, my doctor now is helping me, and I've gotten off a lot of pills. And that's what his mission is, because that's the first thing I said to him when I walked into his office is get me off these pills. Um, yeah. And... I was also in situations where I wasn't with the best partner in my life and my medication would be stolen to sell as currency because they are narcotics. I mean like Oxycontin yeah. and morphine and you know, all those pills, fentanyl patches, everything. And I also know that people sell it for drugs. And I also know that there's an epidemic of fentanyl issues going on in our city and people are dying because it's being mixed in. And it just, it, I think sometimes doctors are a little too quick to grab that prescription pad and write a prescription. And yeah. I talked to a lady who said that she thinks in schools now, instead of having drills on what to do if a gunman enters your school, they should be talking about coping skills like meditation and yeah. how to use your I words. Do. And I, it just blew me away. And I was like, my God, I never would have thought of that. And we need more parents that think like that, and more teachers in schools that do stuff like that, and more doctors to stop writing <laughs> prescriptions really easy. That's just from my point of view, just because of what I've gone through. Um, so what is the most important thing that you can share that you think people need to hear? Because I mean, besides just admitting that, you know, there is something wrong and seeking help, which is a big thing, what what do you think is the key to getting to the point where you are or that I am, that we've finally started healing? Um, I just started being open with everything. And like, uh, again, I, I, uh, I attend the recovery community and, and, uh, so there's lots of sharing in there and, you know, and, and talking about it, you know, like it's okay to talk about it, you know, and, uh, well, you know, by, by admitting your weaknesses, you're helping other people, get strength and like uh and then it's not even uh, maybe I said that wrong thing uh it's not even really a weakness but a seemingly weakness you know it's uh yeah people see but, it as a weakness but it's not yeah like it's not a weakness it's, it's reality right so um you know I I, I I've gone and spoken at a few uh seniors homes and stuff like that and uh and respectfully with all the work that seniors and stuff like that have put in in our society, and they've built our society. Um, the common, the common theme, like I'm 46 years old when I was younger is, oh, you guys got it so easy. You have to walk up to all both ways in the middle of winter. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know, you guys, you kids got it so easy these days. And, and I go talk, I go, when I go speak at seniors homes and, and I tell them, like, I'll do respect to everybody in the room here, but, Honestly, that kind of thinking is not right because the kids in society today have it harder than anyone in history. Yeah. Like if, if there's that much pressure out there with, with choices and drugs and alcohol and yeah, prescription drugs is an epidemic level. Look at the meth crisis. Look yeah. at, like something's wrong that they can, in Winnipeg, there's kids 13, 14 years old, shooting up in back lanes, they find needles everywhere, right? Like yeah. It's, it's insanity. It is. It is. I went out to uh, Thunder Bay and I went out to Toronto and, you know, there's just walking downtown, there's needles everywhere. Craziness. It's just yeah. and And what scares me is I'm bringing up grandchildren. Oh, I mean, I'm obviously not bringing them up. I'm not raising them, but I have grandchildren growing up in this world. And... I always think like, what's going to happen in five years? What's going to happen in 10 years? What are we going to look like? Because it's, it's so chaotic and insane right now. I can't imagine. And I keep talking about the sixties and seventies when they do peace rallies. And honestly, that's what we need. And more people need to turn off the news and turn on music and just like stay away from negativity because we're breeding it over and over and over and over again. And I think the news is responsible for a lot of that too nowadays because it's always sensationalized. Yeah. And I think they minimize all the issues that need to be brought forward in order to talk about like Donald Trump and who he's going to war with or, you know, the Royal wedding, which is all fine and dandy. I mean, that's great, but there's other issues that need to be brought forth 
and people need to start recognizing and start dealing with. And I honestly don't think having drills in school when somebody comes in with a gun is what they should be doing. Unfortunately, they have to. And I mean, that stems back to a lot of these people that are going into these schools do have mental health issues. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's okay, that it's never okay to take another person's life ever, but maybe he didn't get the help at home that he needed and he was suffering or, you know, he may have gotten bullied at school, whatever the case may be, there's always a reason for everything. And we keep focusing on the worst case scenario of all of these children dead, which is the worst case scenario. And then we start talking about gun control. And then we say, no, start talking about mental health. Start talking about parents, like being parents and uh, realizing that there's something going on. And like you said, youth, be more forthcoming. Be open. Talk. Talk. There's so many, so many different avenues that you can go to. Yeah. And and it just makes me sad to see the state of our world now and to, to know that, you know, there's nieces, nephews, you know, grandkids that we all love and we're bringing them up in this world and it just it scares me well you know what it, you know what it's like it's like especially as it pertains to the news and all the everything that's going on and like it seems like the the older people that are in charge and all that kind of stuff um it seems like the government and all that kind of stuff it seems like they're they're resorting resorting to a reactive approach mm -hmm. to things rather than a proactive approach. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, it's better to be proactive than reactive, right? If you're running around fixing problems, like, why not work on not starting the problems, right? So, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, how about, how about don't start the fire instead of having to go put it out all the time, right? Like, yeah, I agree. That is a great way of putting it. That's a great way of putting it. And yeah, everything is reactive now. Everything is. <laughs> well, look at the hospitals. The hospitals, the jails are overflowing and full. The hospitals, the emergency rooms, you, you, you can't get into treatment. Um, the, the treatment centers are full. There's three, four, five month waiting list to get into treatment. Like, it's insanity right now. Like, mm -hmm. there's something wrong. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and, um, and again, like, uh, like it's, I don't want to lessen anybody with, uh, university education and all those kinds of people that are, that are in charge of things, but cause that's me too. I don't want to lessen any of that. It's a lot of work to do. Um, but you know, sometimes you gotta keep, sometimes you gotta dumb it down and just, you know, and, uh, keep it simple. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, there, there's, uh, there's lots of ways to be proactive. Like, like living on Earth is it so expensive to, for 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 parents to put their kids into sports? Mm -hmm. Like, why is sports so expensive? I think sports should be free for all kids across Canada. Oh, so you know what I mean, right? Yeah. <coughs> I, I read a, I read a CENU report. Uh, C E N U, I think it, it is, and it's a Canada it's a Canada uh, statistics thing about how much it costs. I'll probably get it wrong, but anyway, I'm, I'm never usually right. I'm never usually wrong, but I'm never too, too far off. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this thing that I read, and I read it about 10 years ago, I think eight years ago, um, but it, the senior report said, it said how much it costs to house one inmate in jail for a year. Just one inmate with the guards, the food, the, the administration, you name it, the whole, I guess they did it all, like they uh, calculated it all up per inmate, what it would cost to house one inmate in jail for one year. And the, the, the statistics were staggering. One million dollars a year per inmate, it cost somebody, cost taxpayer to house one person in jail for a year. Oh my God. And that was like 10 or 12 years ago. It's way higher yeah. now. Yeah. That's insane. It must be higher now. Yeah. But like, um, you know, they, and they, they're so ready to, to, to lock people up for non-violent drug and alcohol offenses. And, you know what I mean? Like they could, they could funnel that money into more treatment centers or point of contact is the catchphrase. And, you know, when somebody needs help at the point of contact, they can't ask that help. Yeah. And there's a, there's a big problem there. You know, when you're ready to stop or you think you're ready to stop, there's gotta be, uh, you know, there's gotta be 
ways to get help or, or, or what's the point? People just give up. And then, and then you're, then you, you know, if they commit crimes or whatever, whatever's going on, it just costs them to pay a double because they weren't able to access the help when they needed it, right? Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. There needs to be more. There needs to be. I don't, and I mean, I know I'm sure you feel like I feel like we want to change the world. We want it to be how it should be. And it's just kind of like a fighting a losing battle because everybody is reactive, not proactive. And they're, they're just, it's like they're sticking a bandage on a problem that needs more than just a bandage. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's easy to just stick it on there and kind of shuffle them along instead of dealing with what they're going through. And I agree about the jails. And I, I know that there's people in there that I know that are friends of mine that shouldn't be in there. Um, yeah. But they have abuse problems and or addiction problems. And um, they instead of getting help, they were told, oh, you'll, you're just going to fail. And, you know, we're just going to put you here because we don't know what to do with you. And we don't want you back out on the streets. And so then they're yeah, suffering. Insanity. Yeah, they're suffering in jail, not getting the help they need in jail either because there's not enough programs that we're supplying in the jails that are going to help them with, you know, any kind of mental health issues or any kind of addiction problems. I mean, there's some, I'm not going to say there's none, there is some, but there's not enough. There's not enough well, of an am amount of inmates we have. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. Like, um, our, our, uh, the homeless, the homeless mission recovery center, I'm part of, uh, Red Road Lodge. Like, we struggle so much for money. We can't even hire the, hire, uh, the right staff, like, you know, it's hard to even put programming together because we've got no money. Like, it's, yeah. there's no money. I mean, you take care of 47 people and, and, uh, there's no money, you know, like, uh, if it wasn't for, uh, our CEO, like, uh, you know, we keep, we keep it running there, uh, through various, various, uh, avenues for funding. You know what I mean? But, no, there's not a lot of funding. We operate on a bare bones budget, and and, uh, and you know, like it's uh, forty seven people is a lot of people to take care of, right? So, yeah, and there should be never more mind, money. never mind them get trying to get help. There's no help for them. Yeah, God, that's sad. And you know what I noticed too? Um, I live in the same city as Roland does. Just for anybody that's listening, everybody knows that I'm from Winnipeg. Um, I've noticed. People have desensitized themselves when they drive downtown and they see homelessness, like they see the homeless people. It's like they don't yeah. see them anymore. It's just gotten so, it's the norm. You know, no, nobody thinks like, oh my God, you know, people should be doing something to help them. No, they just ignore them or get upset. Well, I, I tell you what, I, like I'm around homelessness all the time mm -hmm. and I've met the most amazing people and I go sit with homeless people all the time and have a smoke or shoot shit, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I go, I go sit with them all the time, and on, honestly, like uh, I'm at the, I'm at our, our, uh, our at our shelter uh, six days a week, and um, um, I'd rather sit there with homeless people than I would at the, at the corporate board from office table. Like it's just it's so real and it's so like yeah. it's, it was just, uh, yeah, liberating I... to know the, the level of honesty and the level of um, you know, and 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 honestly. I've sat and talked to a lot of homeless people, and you know, a lot of people choose to be homeless. There's not even really nothing wrong. They, they just don't want all the responsibilities of the of the mainstream world. And, and mm -hmm. honestly, I can't blame them. Exactly. Sometimes I'd like to go live by the river and do nothing. You know, like, yeah, exactly. I I don't know. I don't know. I, and you know, you know then, there's, then there's a guy like me who takes on the world, and then I complain to myself about how busy I am. Right? So. <laughs> I know there is there's got to be a happy medium somewhere, and and we're missing it somehow. Um, but like I said, Roland, you're an inspiration because you do take on so much, and because you're trying to do so much, and you're only one person too, and you've got to you know realize that oh my god, okay, I can't save the world, and I've got to realize that too because I get I get over whelmed and I want to do so much and I want to change this and I want to change that and I mean we're only one pe one person but in saying that it takes one person to start the change because we all have to be the change it has to start now and, and it should have been started a long time ago but for the love of God these children are growing up thinking that it's okay to you know shoot up or go live on the streets or go to parties that they shouldn't be going to and abusing alcohol and drugs and 
um, unfortunately, our society breeds violence now too, and they think it's okay to be, you know, physical and violent. And there's just so many things that need to be fixed. And I don't know if they will be in our lifetime. And like I said, all we can do is what we're doing and be the change one person at a time, and hopefully start some kind of ripple effect because that's what needs to happen. Because it's not. It's just like we're talking to walls. And every now and then somebody will listen and every now and then more often than not, they won't. So yeah. I, I can understand why you get kind of frustrated. And I know I do. And I know there's a lot of people out there that I talk to on a daily basis that would like to change the world as well and make things better. And it's just, it's, it's hard to do because of the government. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep talking about the government because as far as I'm concerned, they're funneling resources. Like we don't need perks. You know, any more new parks. We don't need any more. We've got parks. You know, yeah. how about deal with the people that are sleeping in those parks? And you're right. right. Some of them some of them want to live on the street. I know I would love to go and just walk into the bush out by Lac de Bonnie where I grew up and just stay there. Because it's way easier than dealing with some of the crap that you have to deal with living in Main Street life. Um, but, yeah, I love, I love what you do. And I know it gets overwhelming, but don't ever stop because I know you've made changes for a lot of people. And I love what you said about sports. My grandson has ADHD. He does extremely well when he's playing football. Um, and my granddaughter yeah. also plays football. And you know what? I think if more children got off the couch and away from video games that are perpetuating violence um, and started participating in sports, the world would also be a different place because then they, they have an outlet to get rid of some of that, you know, anxiety and stress and and anger but because it costs so much it's crazy but anyways yeah. roland um, thank you so much for coming on um i'm going to put roland's website up on my website he also has a book called off the ropes and when you go to his website um you can find out more about roland you can find out about his events and awards you can find his story um he's also got a video gallery up there so it's breakingthechain.ca, and like I said, it'll be up on my website. You just have to click on it, and it'll go directly to Roland's website. I could talk to Roland all day, and I'm going to let him go because I know he's got a life. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I like to. I always try to end up with a positive note and make some a little bit of solutions, and like, uh, you know, there's there's some simple things that uh, that can be done, especially with the. And um, one is encouraging your parents and your grandparents to lock up the prescription meds. If they do have prescription meds in the house, lock them up so they're not accessible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a huge deterrent for, for people and, and uh, for kids. And, and uh, the other one is a simple, a simple, a simple um, fact of communication and if a child doesn't have their emotional needs met in the home, they're going to find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So whatever happened to the eyeball to eyeball communication and sitting down with somebody and talking with them and, hey, how's it going? Like, do you need anything? Like, uh, blah, 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 blah. Like those kinds of, of, uh, that kind of communication is priceless, right? And you, it's, an, it's an easy fix to help somebody feel like they're not alone. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's huge, right? So yeah. I just want to leave it with that. But, uh, um, yeah, I think mean, I can go on this topic all day. So. I know. So could I. So could I. That's why I love yeah. talking to you. But thank you. And for, it's okay to ask for help. It's it okay is. Go see your family doctor and get a referral to psych health and go get a good doctor. And, and that's what I did. And, and Canada is free, right? So, yeah. you know, we're very, very lucky. And, and, uh, you know, that's what I did. I got a referral to psych health and I tapped in. I've been in the same doctor for 14 years now and he's one of the best guys I've ever met, right? So Yeah. And and I know another myth too is, um, a lot, I know I felt this way, so I'm assuming there's other people that feel this way, is when you go to get help and you're thinking, okay, well, he's reading from a book. How can he tell me what I'm supposed to feel and how I'm supposed to feel? He's never walked in my shoes. But you've got to realize that a lot of studying goes into mental health issues and what people go through, regardless of whether they've been in your shoes or not, they can still help. So yeah. that has totally. to go away as well. It doesn't matter if they've been where you are. They know how to help you. Um, I did the same thing. I still I have people that I talk to, and I need to. So, And I know, too, a lot of times, um, like you said, youth, like, do you remember when people would sit down at a kitchen table with their kids 
and ask them about their day. Like you're talking about, like talk to them eyeball to eyeball. Yeah. I just, it needs to come back. I don't know where it went. I'm glad you brought that up. I could, Hey, I'm going to let you go Roland. Cause I'm going to just keep going. Cause that, I, like I said, I could talk to you all day, <laughs> but thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And I'm sure I'll probably have you back on again because this issue needs to be out there and people need to start thinking about, like you said, being proactive instead of reactive. That was one of the best statements I've heard <laughs> in a couple of days, I'm telling you. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for your time. And you take it easy. Okay, have a good day. You too. And remember, everyone, treat everyone how you would like to be treated. And a smile goes a mile.